Joker. Joker. It may be, for me, the movie of the year. Because while there are many, many actually very good movies this year, and we'll talk about them here before the end of the year, there was no movie where I needed to go for a very long walk after the movie. It so affected me in such a profound way. Joker starring Joaquin Phoenix and directed by Todd Phillips, who is my guest today on my podcast, Rumble with Michael Moore. Thank you um, for listening. Todd Phillips uh, is uh, an amazing (laughs) director, and he's directed all kinds of movies from documentaries to the Hangover series, hilarious comedies. And, um, And now this, the kind of film you really haven't seen since Stanley Kubrick. That it's that profound in its in its um, intent and ability to grab the audience in in such a way that you know this is a piece of art set very much in the times in which we live. It's a brave piece of filmmaking. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's nothing about really what you heard about, perhaps. It's, it's, if it's the kind, if you, you don't, if you don't go to Batman movies or comic book movies, that's fine. This isn't, this is a movie for you. And I don't want anybody to miss out on this movie. And that's why I wanted Todd on my show today. Um, It's going to run a little long. It's going to run about 90 minutes. Um, But I have to tell you, I, I just, I listened to it and, you know, we have a policy here of not cutting things out. We want you to hear everything in the raw unedited, uncensored. And, but uh, this conversation I thought was an important one to listen to. Now, the first half hour of it isn't even about Joker. It's about Todd Phillips and how he became Todd Phillips. Um, But it's a fascinating story, especially if you're a young person who wants to be a filmmaker. Maybe you're in school. Maybe, maybe you're out of school. Maybe you didn't go to school like me. (laughs) You just... You love the movies. How how did he get to the point where he made Joker? Um, that's the first half hour. Um, and then at around the 30 minute mark, we get into talking about Joker and um, what this film is really about, the struggles he had to go through to get it made, the um, in the days leading up to its release, the uh, the absolute belief that he and Joaquin had that they were doomed because of all the press about what the press was saying the film was about. That It's just a fascinating, um, insightful look at um, how a movie like this even gets made. Um, and that's the, that's the, six, the 60 minutes the, of after these uh, opening 30 minutes. It's just amazing. And, all I ask really too is that you definitely make it listen to the last half hour of this. It's one of the best discussions I've ever had um, either in any of my movies or here in this podcast studio that I, I built in my apartment. Uh, it's uh, um, Todd Phillips gets into talking about why we really do this, why we need to do it in a time like this the responsibility of artists to stand up, to fight, to say something, to be of substance, all of this. Ah, it's so, it was, um, um, don't miss the last half hour of this. Um, And I think I'll just leave it at that and we'll get right, uh, we'll get right to it as we begin our discussion about what is humor and comedy and satire and, and who are the people that bring us bring it to us? Um, um, I'm really glad you're you've tuned in to this. Uh, we've done this now for a week. This podcast I just started it, and the reaction has been overwhelming. Over the weekend, we went to number one on the charts on the podcast charts. I didn't know that there were podcast charts. Uh, went to number one on the news charts and number three on the overall all pack all podcasts. Number three. And this is like whoa. Um, so for those of you who made that happen because you're listening to it, thank you. Please subscribe. 
please, you know, rate the show, uh, make comments, review it, whatever, uh, share it with your friends. Um, um, but subscribe. It's free. It's free. There's nothing, there's no, nothing here. You just, I just want you to listen. I just want to be, uh, you know, a little piece of your life. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you let me into that. And, um, it's, it's important right now, especially that we, that we all talk to each other and we have this, um, this interaction and this conversation. And I'm so glad to invite you into this conversation that I just had with uh, Todd Phillips, the director of Joker. I have felt this way for, since I was a teenager thinking, isn't that interesting that the funniest comedians are our funniest satirists or, or, yeah. and I wonder how much, and, and, and maybe you've studied this too, because you know, you've made some of the, some great comedies. And in my opinion, uh, hangover is easily in the top three of the modern day thank you film comedies right thank you you know um now what are the other two right. uh bridesmaids right there's something about mary yeah um, i would say borat stepbrothers oh, borat, I mean, yeah <laughs> i don't know where to put borat because yeah. it's kind of uh it's, i was a writer on borat i got nominated for an academy award for borat is that right yeah yeah oh my god um worked with such on that so but, you started working the whole idea out with him yes, early on very oh early my god yeah what yeah. was that like it was amazing I, I met him early and i and i there's another angry guy <laughs> yes yeah again i mean it does it's a lot of i mean because you know comedy is based in truth and sometimes truth makes you angry and you know truth nowadays has become offensive and so a lot of comedy has become offensive and <laughs> it's a very weird kind yeah. of time to live um yeah but comedy has to be offensive yes i mean otherwise because comedians it has to be irreverent and, irreverent uh, and, yes but comedians are saying the things the rest of us are afraid to say They're, it's they, literally the job <laughs> yeah so you're setting yourself up for you know um maybe you know maybe people aren't gonna like me if i say this but it's um if some of these things don't get said no matter how painful it is to listen to them yeah then i think we're the worse off for it yeah that's yeah. my feeling about that but i think that that I don't know when I say, you know, like your film, like Hangover or Bridesmaids or there's something about Mary or uh, or some of the others that you mentioned. Well, uh, Borat and Step Brothers. Yeah. And just, and Step, Brothers. Step Brothers just, <laughs> to me, was the most rewatchable comedy. You see, I also believe as filmmakers, you know, because people will say to me, well, Mike, you know, I'm, I, the kinds of, I don't make the films that you make. You know, you're so, they're so, these issues are so important. And, and I'm like, no, no, no. My belief as all of us as filmmakers, if we do nothing else, then after the end of a hard week, people work hard. We work longer hours in this country than any other country. Yeah. At the end of the week, if we can give them a couple of hours of of joy, of course, of 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 any of a range of emotions. Yeah, I mean, the whether greatest, they're crying, yeah, <laughs> whether they get mad, yep, any of that. We've done a service, I think. Yeah, I've had that so many times where well, I made old school or the Hangover movies or where somebody would come up to me and be like, I just got to tell you, I saw your movie. I'd been in the worst mood for two weeks. I saw your movie and it just made me forget everything and laugh for two hours. And I, I literally feel better after. Yes. I mean, there is value in coming. I mean, it's what, right? Sullivan's Travels, right? right. Preston Sturge's film. Right. It's, there is... There is value. You're, you're, you're adding value to the world. When you can make a movie like The Hangover made so much money around the world, you could do the math, you go, oh, you made 80 million people laugh. That's right. not nothing. <laughs> no, I think it's really something. And I think that actually Sullivan's Travels was on TV this week. Oh, fine. I just happened to cross it, so I watched it again. Yeah. And and if you haven't seen the film, it's um, Basically, the, the the long and the short of it is a, a Hollywood film director. This is the set in the forties. Right? Yeah, I think. late thirties. Late thirties. Yeah, late thirties. Yeah. yeah, it was the depression. Right. Um, and uh, he decides he doesn't want to make frivolous comedies anymore. He wants to go make Oh Brother Where Art Thou, a serious, social-minded 
film about the hard times everybody's going through. And, uh, and so he goes out, he decides to become a, 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 a what would be called a hobo. Right, back then, it was very, like a homeless person, but then it was yes. literally a hobo. And like go undercover as a hobo. Undercover right. as a, so imagine like a Hollywood director today deciding I'm gonna go undercover as a homeless person in downtown LA. Right. And, uh, and out of that, I'm going to make my, my, my masterpiece, my opus. And, um, and so, but what he finds out along the way, just to skip to the end of the movie, is that in the end, and of course he's been arrested, he's been <laughs> imprisoned. Right. They, he's on a work gang in a prison, and he's and the prisoners are being taken to a church where it's you know uh, Monday movie night. They're showing it on a wall, a yep. movie. With all, he's there with all the other prisoners, and he's so upset, and he's just like, and and it's a it's an old early early Walt Disney movie. Yeah. Right. So um, he uh, he notices everybody is so happy. And it's a black church. Yeah, it's it's people who in the '30s would be having it the worst. Not that it's mm. a hell of a lot better now, but right. basically. And he looks around the church, and everybody is laughing and smiling and touching each other, like, "Oh, this is so right!" Great. Slapping, slapping each other on the back. Other back, and and he's like, "Oh, wait a minute! I used to do this. I used to make these kinds of films," and um, and he came to that conclusion that yeah. you just said that right. there's value in this. Yeah. And that he decides to go back and make a, a comedy because people needed relief yeah. from, especially during the Great Depression, what they were all going through. Yeah. So, so, so you, so you start, well, you actually, you started out as a documentary filmmaker. I did. Yeah. Right. I did. I started out doing documentaries. Did you graduate from film school? I didn't. I, you did. You did I, I dropped you drop out. out. You dropped out. Yeah. Did you ever finish college? No, I didn't finish NYU. I went to NYU and, and the, the reason I dropped out wasn't some big rebellious reason. It was literally, I couldn't afford the college to, and finish the movie I was making. So the project started as my junior year um pro documentary I, I went you know at nyu there was two 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 ways you can go you can go narrative or documentary i literally went the documentary route because i didn't know that i had it in me to write scripts yet i feel like sometimes you go to film school and a lot of 18 year olds don't have much to say so i always viewed documentaries as a way to kind of live life on fast forward to get life experience you know like to be in places and do things you wouldn't normally do and at the same time make a film um I mean, the first movie, just to backtrack, that that actually made me want to be a filmmaker was Gimme Shelter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Maisel's and Charlotte Swernon's mm -hmm. film on the Altamont and yeah. the, the 69 um, yeah. uh, Rolling Stones uh, tour. And the reason why that was is because if you remember that movie, I saw it on VHS at a friend's house when I was like 12 years old. His dad had it. It was They filmed in the editing room. Do you remember that amazing, where yes. they brought the cameras in the editing room and yeah. they were showing the stones, what happened at Altamont yeah. with the stabbing. Yeah. And I'd never seen an editing room and it was the first time I understood that there are people behind movies. You know right, what I mean? Like, right. oh, look at that. And that's how a movie's made. And they have right. this big machine. It was an eight plate Steenbeck back then. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I just went the documentary program at NYU. Uh, so I started this, the first film I made is a, a film called Hated, G.G. Allen and the Murder Junkies. It was about this punk rock band and, and um, on the scene in New York, although they, they weren't a New York band, he was actually in Detroit. He was in, he got arrested and he was in jail in Ann Arbor, Michigan. When we started the movie, I'd written him in jail, said, I want to do a movie about you. He was going to get out in three months. And, uh, mm. and he broke parole to come to New York and do the movie. So wow. the, the movie was about him putting his band back together, the documentary was about, and this sort yeah. of tour, uh, fresh out of jail. Um, he and this been, was in the- This was in 91. 91. Yeah. Yeah, so he- Breaking parole in Michigan in 91, you know, the state was already broke. Right, so they're not going to track him down. No, he's tracking, there's nobody left to track yeah, him down. Yeah, he literally called me from jail and he's like, well, you know, you guys either come out here and do it because I'm on parole and I can't leave the state. And I go, oh, well, I can't bring like three crew people out there. I had no money to make this you're, movie. You're a junior in, in and he college. Goes, I'm a junior in college at NYU and he goes, uh, well, if you send me a bus ticket, I'll just come to New York and we'll do it there. And so I literally FedExed him a one-way bus ticket and he came and we started the movie here and he started putting his band back together and that's what the movie's about. Wow. But So I dropped out of NYU because I couldn't afford the the 
tuition at NYU, obviously, and finish this film. Um, so finished it, and and that's how I got started. Mm. So so you dropped out of NYU, and you're so an, then, you're an undergrad. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, I was in the undergrad program. So didn't go back. You don't have a degree. No. Okay. Although this, this in is depressing fairness, to people listening to this who are now who are paying forty thousand a year for masters, right? <laughs> well, I was a New York City resident, so I got a ton of financial aid. So really, I was only paying three grand a year to go to NYU. Wow. Don't um, tell people that either. That's <laughs> just so depressing. So, but I still those still to get that three grand, you do loans, right? right so you know, right. you finish, but. So I needed that three grand of junior and senior year to actually finish the movie. Um, but but in fairness, I, I should say that when the hangover, the first hangover won the Golden Globe for uh, best comedy or yeah. music, whatever that best film is. of the year. Uh comedy yes exactly <laughs> best film of the year parentheses comedy it won the golden globe and um the dean at the time of nyu sent me uh fedex me a diploma with a letter and she said can you please stop saying you didn't graduate from nyu oh my god Which i thought was really sweet Jeez, so i, I should i should say I that i dropped out in my sophomore year of uh university of michigan flint branch okay <laughs> They have never sent me. <laughs> oh, really? That's no, insane. anything. And in fact, Michigan State noticed that that Michigan had never done that for me, so they gave me an honorary doctorate oh, that's a beautiful. couple of years ago. That's beautiful. But um, but anyway, so okay, so so you start with documentaries. You start with this one. Yeah. Then, when I first met you, yes, it was your second. Yeah, the second movie that we did for. Uh, HBO and um, when frat, I was doing it was frat house, it right? was called frat house and uh, it was sort of this uh, look at fraternities and hazing in the in the mid to late 90s there and um, when I was doing hated um, after I was also interning for Sheila Nevins the great Sheila Nevins That's at right, HBO because right. I was obsessed with documentary right, and I just right. knew if I get in there I can see how these things are made and you know um, and Sheila was amazing to me, knew I dropped out of school and still let me intern when I was dropped out for another year there. I was with her for two years. Um, and then I brought her this idea uh, with a friend of mine to do um, Frat House and she gave us the money to do it. And, and, and we went and made it and it ended up winning the grand jury prize at Sundance where I don't remember if you were as on the judge, if you were on the jury I that on, year. I can't remember if that was the year I was on the I know Nick Broomfield was on the jury. Were you ever yeah, with him? Yeah. I, oh. I, I, I remember, well, I know I was, I was there that year also because I, I had made um, a documentary uh, where I had traveled across the country on a book tour. Yeah. And it was called The Big One. Right. And and you know what I most remember about that? This is January of 98, Eight, right? Yep. Okay. While we're there that week at Sundance, the news breaks about uh, Monica Lewinsky oh, and the right. whole thing right. that led to his impeachment right. be, began. I remember that that all, we, we were like going to movies and then trying to watch TV. Like, right. Holy crap, what's going to happen here? Yeah. So, but uh, so so we you have to remind me how we met. There, so, then, well, uh, I just met you because you're Michael Moore and I've been obsessed with you because I know documentary filmmakers the way some people know uh, rock singers, you know, right. meeting you and Nick Broomfield there for me was was not a small thing. So I still have a photo of you. And I think it was your wife at the time. I'm standing in between you. <laughs> you, you have your <laughs> arm around me and yeah. I just have a beaming smile. It's literally in my office in L.A. Oh, my God. Uh, um, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Now, see, obviously, you somebody I can't remember no, everybody I took a picture with, but um, it was a big moment for me. And uh, yes, but uh, but my arm was around you. It was so that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> but so I guess you were on the jury that year. If it was with Christine Choi, Nick Broomfield, you, I remember them all there. Yes, and so, so that, that must have been the year that I was on the on the jury on the jury. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So thank you because you awarded us the grand jury prize for this. Wow. Movie. So so. So then I can take some credit for Joker. Yes. Is that what you're sure. trying to say? Yeah, here? because yeah. it led to everything. <laughs> Isn't that, that amazing how that happens? Yeah. So, you, so you make this documentary, it wins the grand prize at Sundance. Right. But then if I now remember correctly, it did not air. Yes, it didn't air. Because of some. Well, it, just, it didn't air because quite frankly, we made a movie at the time. HBO was making movies called high on crack street and American skinhead and, you know, movies yeah, yeah, about yeah. Yeah. Um, niche films about underrepresented right. people. We made a movie about rich, wealthy white kids oh, right. beating each other up and right. overly represented kids. Right. And the truth of the matter is we went about it wrong. I remember when 
we would approach these kids, as you know, making documentaries, you yeah. have to get releases signed. Mm. And I would go to these kids and say, hey, you know, uh, you got to sign this release before we start mm. filming. Yeah, yeah. And the kid would look, you know, when I did that on my punk rock movie, they sign it. They're like, yeah, whatever. When I did that on Frat House, they would go, oh, yeah, let me just uh, fax this to my dad. He's a lawyer. And, oh. and, and then I would go, cool. And then I go, five minutes later, I'd walk up to the guy. I'd go, you know what? I gave you the wrong one. Uh, I'm going to give it to you tomorrow. Yeah. And we would basically wait yeah. for them to get drunk and stoned <laughs> and then right. reapproach them. Right. That was a problem. Yes. But we did it wrong. And they're not. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if that was so wrong. Well, because you mean, because later then they. Later what, they came they, out and oh, said, I signed that. I was got, drunk at a got party. The money and, and daddy their parents to who sue think you. Their parents thought they're never going to work again if people oh, see brother, this movie because right. they're acting like this animals. Is like before Facebook. Yes. So oh, way before. Where you, so, yeah. This is fax machines, literally. So this is. So the idea is that. There's now footage that's going to be out there, in this case on HBO, right. of Sonny Boy. That's right. Uh, and he's not going to get a job at one of the top law firms in that's New York. That's exactly so. what it was. Wow. So then they came after HBO and Sheila, even though she's been amazing to me, and I would never have a bad word to say about her. She was so supportive. It just became mired in a lot of BS, mm. honestly, and, and it just never aired. Oh, I'm but sorry. But it's kind of weird because yeah. in, in some ways it made the movie... It gave. Do you remember Todd Haynes's film, The Karen Carpenter? Of story? course, one of my favorite of all right? time. Yes. But it's almost bigger because it never is. You're not actually allowed. To you see can't it, see it. Right? You yeah. can only watch it on VHS tape. And so Todd Haynes, uh, who's uh, a film um, uh, that he has out uh, right now, is uh, uh, Dark Waters. Dark Waters with, with Mark Ruffalo. Ruffalo. Yeah. Wonderful film. He. Uh, he made a film. I actually call it a documentary because I have a very broad view of what a documentary is in terms of it being a nonfiction work of art. That's right. He told the Karen Carpenter story. The Carpenters were an old group back in the 70s and whatever, and had hits like Close to You. Uh, but she had died of anorexia and she'd had quite a tough life. Um, he told the entire story on film with Barbie dolls. He essentially animated Barbie dolls, but real Barbie dolls. Yes. Um, playing Karen and her brother Richard and the parents and everything. And Mattel, which owns Barbie. Right. <laughs> so no fucking said, way. No way. Cease and desist. <laughs> yes. And so nobody. So he had it out in a couple theaters. I saw it in a theater in D.C. Wow. And uh, and then it got pulled, and yeah. that was the end of that, and nobody has seen it. So my point is, in a weird way, it's become a bigger movie by the, the uh, inability to see it. You are, un you know, and, are and, we still unable to to watch Frat House? Is yeah, that? I guess the truth is, I feel like if I approach those kids, if I know how to get in touch with them, they would yeah. love it because it's a great yeah. like window into a time when they were acting like morons they're all right i'm sure have kids now they have jobs they're 45 at this point who cares right, right. But, but this this but actually, i don't know how to reach them but i bet you they would love it well maybe they are listening <laughs> yes <laughs> number one number two for all you youtube hacktivists out there uh if you can get a copy of frat house <laughs> oh i'll tell you this it's out there it's oh, it on youtube there. You yeah can see oh it. yeah it's it's oh. like up and around i've seen like it floating around youtube yeah it is it is out there now that i think about it of course you just gave me an idea i have a film festival in michigan in the summers that I should do um, one of these years a, 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 a section of the festival of these yes. films. You know, the other one is the, the Jerry Lewis one, The Day the Clown Cried. But oh. that's the one that Jerry Lewis doesn't want people to that, see. Remember his, yes. his Nazi right. camp film? Yes. And then I think he said, you can show it after I die. So he's plus gone. 10 years. Oh, so plus there 10? was some other uh, additional like... Ten years after I die, which is pretty pretty epic. But again, but again, because my festival's in Michigan, yeah, and there's no rules. Yeah, anymore. you just show it. Yeah, and and ten years in dog years. Yes. What is and by that? the way, I'm, don't quote me because it might have just been two years. I actually don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do. There's like movies like that that are that would be a great section yeah, instead of like show, Midnight Madness. No, just show like, the Karen Carpenter show, show Frat yeah, House, yes. show the Jerry Lewis. Perfect. I think that yes, you've just given me a, a great idea, and uh, and and I will I'll I'll indemnify everybody yeah, in case any, anybody gets anybody gets. Uh, frankly, those kids that you filmed back in the '90s, they'll probably love. That's what I mean. Looking I think, at their yeah, of course, young drunken. That's right. I think titled selves. I think they'll get a kick out of it at this point. So okay, so so okay. Now you've made this uh, great documentary. It's won the grand jury prize at Sundance with these filmmakers, yes. these documentary filmmakers that you just mentioned that are uh, great uh, filmmakers uh, like yourself and Nick well, Broomfield and Christine Choi. <laughs> well, I, I meant I meant them, not me. <laughs> okay. uh, but yes, Christine Choi, who killed Vincent Shin, yeah. great documentary, and Best Hotel on Skid Row, great uh, yes. documentary. 
Um, Nick Broomfield, who's epic and crazy. And films. then you have the, yes, Brit. Now, but now you have the crushing experience of uh, it's not going to air. Yeah. And I, I know this feeling um, because Michael Eisner, uh, after watching um, Fahrenheit 9 11, because Miramax was owned by Disney. I, yeah, of course. Uh, said, we can't show this. Wow. And we decided that. to. Yeah, we're, of course. And you started Excalibur. Of course I remember that, right? <laughs> I literally remember the name. Didn't Harvey start. It's, it Exc wasn't. No, it wasn't. Ex wait a minute. Did it I was, make that uh, up? No, 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 no. You're, you're in the right track because he um, he formed a company called uh, based on Lord of the Rings. Uh, the Fellowship Adventure Group. Oh, and and then it got destroyed, but only after the New York Times did a front page story on how Disney doesn't want you to see this film that right. Moore made. Right, and then it was like that's the like the gift from heaven. Right, tell the public that they can't see something. Yeah. Like right now, people are already trying to. They're looking up how to see Frat House. Right, <laughs> because <laughs> because yeah. because you already have millions of fans from the Hangover trilogy, but now this year's film. Uh, you know, I just as a documentary filmmaker, I want to go watch this film. I want to, I somehow have to see Fred this Fred, film yes. that you, by the way, voted on. You just don't remember. It's fine. Yeah. No, no, no. No, but that's, I, of course I don't remember. It's like 20 years <laughs> ago. Course. How would I remember it? Right, right. No, it's like, that's when you said to me, I think you were on the jury. I'm like, I was on a jury. <laughs> you know, usually judges don't let me on juries. That's so <laughs> that's funny. my experience. No, but I have to, no, you, I mean, you'll give me a copy of it, right? I, I mean, don't I know can, that I even have copies, believe it or not. I, 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 I do. That's Are you true. required by the lawyers to say that? <laughs> no, we do. I have DVDs somewhere in, in my office, and we've we've given them out to people. So if I can't find the pirated I, I, version, I will give it to you, of course. All right, all right. But but you're right. That feeling, what you said about Michael Eisner and your film, there's, there's a little bit of panic that ensues. You know how much work we know. We know how much oh, I work thought goes into we these were things. over. And you know? by the way, I thought we might have been over with Joker, just to, to to where we where the the narrative on Joker started heading in the media. I started thinking, Jesus, this is going to be one of those things where Warner's, because it's owned by AT and T, and the, yeah. you know Warner Media, it's a much bigger thing than Joker will ever be. Do they just go? This isn't worth the headache. So you do. There was a minute there. No, that's what I exactly thought was going to happen in the month leading up to Joker. After you won uh, the, I think the top prize in Venice, yeah. at the Venice Film Festival, which was probably around Labor Day. It was exactly Labor Day. It yeah. was Labor Day. Okay. Um, and they started right in on. Um, certain media people describing what this film was. And I thought, no, no. And, and I, I really, uh, he made hangover. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, come on. And um, the media just, they picked it up. And all of a sudden the fear level started rising. Then the national media, uh, the nightly news did stories about, they're worried that if people, if you, you know, uh, you're taking your life into your hands if you go see Joker because people are going to come into the theater and shoot it up or yeah. or somebody's going to come in dressed like Joker. And in fact, if I remember correctly, uh, some studio, some theater chains, I don't know if it was Warner Brothers themselves, but they put out a directive that if you came to Joker dressed as Joker, you could not get in That's right. to the theater. Yeah, a couple chains did that. I don't, I don't want to say which ones because I actually don't remember, but there was two big ones, and there's not that many, where they said, yeah, no costumes and none of that, which I get and, and understand. Totally get it, yeah. but what's the message to everybody else? I'm going to take my life in my hands right. to see a Joaquin Phoenix movie? <laughs> right. No, I'm not going to do that. Right. And and so so a week or so before it comes out, you have your screening at the New York Film Festival. Yes. I go to it. And I can't get into Lincoln Center because it is surrounded by police cars yeah. with all their lights going. Yeah. And I said to the cops, what's going on here? Well, we're here in case there's any trouble. I said, what trouble? Well, haven't you heard? And of course I had heard. Right. But I just wanted to hear what they were gonna say. <laughs> yeah. What they were gonna say. And and I said, you know, these are people who had to buy expensive tickets to go to the New York Film I know. Festival. And like donors for the festival dressed yes. up and they're like there's there, six SWAT cars parked outside that was, you know, out of Lincoln Center. It was it was It was crazy. And and and, of and course, it was a bummer for us because, you know, it's hard enough to open a movie, as we all know, and you're just like, Oh, is this what we're up against? Um uh, even the night Joaquin and I went out, the Friday night it opened, and we're finally like, okay, it's coming out. We went out to theaters in New York City, yeah. the theater right here in, uh, in your neighborhood and mm -hmm. the, another, one, another one downtown, and there's eight 
car, eight cop cars oh in my, front of yeah. every theater in New York, and yeah. armed, armed, of course, cops yes. in the theaters. Armed cops in We're the We're passing th- them yes. on escalators as they're changing shifts. When's the last time you saw police people in the theater? No. Well, so, so I you thought must we have, were dead. Yeah, no, no. I, I thought, thought so the too. The movie was dead. Yeah. I thought so too. Number one, opening weekend, which counts for everything. Yeah. Uh, people aren't going to go. Right. They've been scared away from this. Uh, they've been told that the movie, and I'm not going to quote anybody specifically, but in the early reports, uh, people were posting online stories how uh, this this is really a movie uh, that honors the uh, the alt right, the incels, the 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 tiki torch carrying people in Charlottesville, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. It, it must have, and of course, just we'll get to the movie about what it's about here, but. If you, if you haven't seen it, it's the opposite of that. And so as the director, uh, this just must have, I would have been going crazy. And all this effort, all these years, it took years to make this. Yeah, of course. From the first thought you yeah. had to do it. Yeah. And now it's going to be killed because somebody started a rumor that started more press, started saying that people are going to um, possibly lose their lives yeah. if they go see I mean, it was this literally movie. on the ticker I was uh, of CNN, and then I went to London, and it was on their ticker on uh, Channel 4 or Sky News, I mean, you know, going across every two minutes of, like, you know, um, theaters um, embracing for... For issues, you know, are, are bracing for issues uh, as Joker heads to theaters in two weeks. And you're going, what? What are you talking about? Theaters are, br- that's what it said. <laughs> yeah, theaters something are like that, you know, or, Joker or, or heads expecting the, the worst or, you know, fears set in as Joker's coming in a week to theaters. And it's like, what is going on? Right. Um, so here you are. Now it's it's 20 years past your prize it, that you won at Sundance. Yes, exactly. Um, and 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 this film from 20 years ago never makes it to the public and now um people have tried to position this film as something that it isn't yeah. and you're thinking that the w- days leading up to that weekend and that weekend well i think after the first day you saw yes because the gross is by the end of the weekend yeah no we had a massive weekend but we're still sort of white knuckling it because to be totally honest with you you start to think that these reports become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. And I don't want to sound like a maniac, like a Donald Trump kind of person, but you start going, I think they want it to happen. Mm -hmm. There's no way. There Mm -hmm. were news vans parked outside of every theater Joaquin and I went to. What are those news vans there for? They're waiting for something to happen. You start thinking that they want something to happen. (laughs) So you start going, they're driving home after all the five or six showings of the night, disappointed. (laughs) Because right. they expected something to go down. Right. So it really became, it was really uh, an absolute bummer because it was should have been a time, as you know, you put a movie out and listen, I'm not, I'm not whining about it. I don't want to sound like I'm whining, but it should be a time where you're like, all right, here we go. You got, you know, you're excited. And we were just, Joaquin and I were just dreading every day because it was just a new report of, of some think piece that was written about the movie. And we had, a, a you know, besides all that, we had all these think pieces that came out by people that didn't see the movie. Think pieces that literally said, I haven't seen the movie. I'm not going to see the movie. Yeah. Uh, you shouldn't see the movie. And here's why. And they would write a think piece about yeah. it without having seen it. Yeah. And it was really like, what is going on? What is going on here? <laughs> and, and, and everybody would say the movie was political and you'd ask somebody on the left, uh, nobody could define how it was political because it wasn't political. The movie's humanist, you know? Right. But the right would say it's about, uh, universal health care which i would argue it actually is mm-hmm. and the left would say it's about alt-right and incel culture which it never was we no. know what the hell that was and no. where that came from it was really yeah um, but you know what it's what you just said before what we were saying about karen carpenter about saying about when disney stepped in on New York, it, suddenly the new york times was writing about it on the front page of your film suddenly it it probably in the long run helped i mean it certainly it certainly the movie was the most talked about movie of the fall and it was talked and half of that chatter was all the the nonsense and you know craziness right so you know it probably ultimately helped and certainly feels you know vindicating that a movie that was supposed and supposed supposed to according to cnn and 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 every other news network and newspaper was supposed to cause mass violence really ended up just causing a bunch of people to go to the Bronx and dance on a set of, you know, on a staircase. On the right from the scene <laughs> so in the movie. That's definitely right? yeah. an indicating feeling. Yeah. Joker, um, really, it really blew me away. I had listened to all the pre-news, so-called news, 
um, about what this film was about and uh, the damage it was going to cause. And uh, and as I sat there, um, not 10 minutes into it, I can't believe, first of all, that this film got made. And second of all, that the the, the spirit of Stanley Kubrick <laughs> has returned. Wow. That's really how it felt. Okay. Like I could see that you were not going to obey the rules. Um, the We were told this was an origin story about a not in this case a superhero, but a supervillain. And, you know, 20 minutes into the film, you realize that's not going to happen. You have not created Gotham, uh, Gotham City, as as some sort of uh, weird version of New York. It is New York. Right. You're just, you, now maybe maybe you'll tell me that you were just trying to save an art direction because you only had so much money for the budget, but you made a decision to have this story set in New York. Yeah. But I just, you know, before I, I get too effusive here, Thank you. Um, I just, I, I just want to lay my cards out on the table that uh, this film, people listening to this, if you haven't seen it, is a masterpiece. Um, is it uncomfortable? Yes. Um, will you think about it? for the next week or two or three? Yes. Because it's that disturbing. Yes. But why is it disturbing? And um, without giving really too much of it uh, away, even though many people by now obviously have, have, yeah, uh, feel free to give it away. It's funny you say that because somebody came up to me at a screening and said to me, this movie comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfort, the, the comfortable. comfortable. Yes, and uh, I don't know if the, he made it up. I don't know if that's no. A quote. I, it's a very, it's oh, a very it's a famous. Fam- okay, I thought that was quote. Great. You know, one of the great muckrakers right. of the early twentieth century okay. said, "The purpose of journalism is to comfort the afflicted, right, and to afflict the comfortable." Right, and for us, they said he said he he made it. This guy changed it, and again, maybe it was changed. It was the, the the purpose of art? He was basically saying was to comfort the disturbed, yes, and disturb the comfortable. And I thought that was a that was a pretty interesting that, take on the movie. That is exactly what art uh, should do, mm-hmm. and that's what what this film does because it is is set in the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, no dates flash on the screen, but it's, it looks that, you can tell it's by the cars. It's not now, yeah. It's not now, but it feels like now. Yeah. Uh, not in the sense where the graffiti's on the subways and all that, but that um, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for a lot of people uh, to get by. The the We now have more than half the country um, literally living from paycheck to paycheck. That, that awful statistic this year that over 50% of the public does not have $500 to their name, not in the bank, not in their pocket, obviously, not anywhere. So that, and the way they, this story started was because someone had, a, a, a loved one, and a grandparent had died um, on the other side of the country here. Uh, and she couldn't afford the plane ticket wow. to go to California and back. And that's that was sort of the the lead of the story is that the majority of Americans, if a loved one passed away tonight, don't have the money to go to the funeral. Mm. And when it's put like that, right. it's like, yeah, that is the time in which we live. And yes, the unemployment rate's really low, but all that's saying is that people are being employed at seven dollars and twenty five right. cents an hour, right, or ten dollars an hour, or yeah. whatever. But um, uh, so so. This film that you make during this time that we're in, and uh, and I'm sure you had the idea to make this before Trump uh, had been elected. Well, before he was elected, but really the idea came to me in August of 2016. So he was already oh, so the was candidate, and, and it was it was going down. And so I went start to, there. Start tell tell me how you. Where did where did this come from? So it's it's the year is 2016. Yeah, the election I'll tell is you taking exactly place. what it is. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't so much about the election at that moment to have the idea, but the idea was really about. I had another film that I made right prior to this called War Dogs, mm. and you know, we make these movies. You work as hard on the ones that do well as you do on the ones that don't do well or don't sort of set the world on fire. And I remember I was standing outside on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, um, pacing because I never sit through premieres and screenings. They make me too nervous. And uh, 
I started thinking about, wow, this movie's not going to, as I said, set the world on fire. And God, the business has really changed. And it's so hard to cut through the fog nowadays with films. And I sitting there smoking a cigarette, staring at this billboard for a comic book film. And I'm realizing this is really where the business is headed. And the movies I grew up on, the movies that really shaped me growing up, these films from the 70s, whether it's Scorsese and Taxi Driver or mm. Sidney Lumet films or One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I go, you couldn't even get those movies made nowadays. If, right. if, if you walked in with, 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 you know, uh, uh, with that script for network, could that movie even get made nowadays? Mm. And then no. I said, and then I thought, well, you could make it if you made it about one of those guys, literally staring at the billboard. And I just thought, wow, there's a way to kind of sneak a movie through the system, a movie about something, something meaningful, if you kind of dress it up this way. And as mercenary as that sounds, that's really what the idea was. Um, and so that the head of Warner Brothers at the time, the premiere was on August 14th, I think. He was away with his- Of War Dogs. Of War Dogs, sorry. So this is August so of 2016. August of 2016. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the head of Warner's, his name is Greg Silverman, he called me because he couldn't come to the premiere because it was a week before his kids started school and they had to go on vacation. So he knows me because I've made six, seven movies at Warner's that I'm always standing outside on Hollywood Boulevard at the premieres. So he calls me on the phone and says, hey man, I knew you'd be outside. I knew you'd pick up. I just want to tell you, I'm sorry, I'm not there. Love you, love the movie. You know, we're going to support it, whatever. And I go, hey, Greg, you know, I have this idea. Literally the day of the, for me, the wow. night of the premiere. While the film is While the film's playing inside. And, yeah, inside. There's 700 people in there. And he goes, yeah, what is it? And I told him, I said, Joe, you know, oh, so, so when I'm looking at that billboard, I thought, boy, you could do it about one of these guys. You get that movie made. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not a really a comic book movie guy. I find that they're for children, quite frankly. I, I've always find them they're, 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 they, they, they go down too easy for me in a mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about, well, what if you did it about one of the bad guys? You know, what if you took a, a, a villain and gave him? So anyway, so I pitch it to Greg on the phone and he loves it. Like literally I do five minutes on it, what it, what it is. I hadn't had it worked out yet. What it, of course, with the movie that we all see now, but I had the idea. And he goes, wow, I love that. You know, that sounds amazing. Let's talk about it next week when I get back. When the movie ends, the head head of the studio, Greg's boss, who is in the Chinese theater, comes out and says, what's going on? Greg's been texting me for 10 minutes. Uh, he has all these texts from Greg. He told me you have a great idea. And he goes, come ride with me to the party. Because, you know, the parties for the premieres. This one right. happened to be at the Sunset Tower. So there was a good drive. Right. He goes, come ride in my car with me and tell me it. Oh so I God. pitch it to him in the car going to the Sunset Towers. And by the time we're at Sunset Towers, it's done. Go ride it. That sounds really cool. Um, as you know, in the movie business, regimes change. I've had a deal at Warner since 2004. That's almost 16 years. I've seen that regime change happen four or five times at this right. point. So while I'm off writing the script with, with Scott Silver, who I wrote it with, the regimes change and all those people I had this great sort of pitch oh. with at Warner's, now it's a new group, you know? Um, so we had to jump through some more hoops and, you know, <clears throat> you've seen the movie, you know, it was, it's, they, they ultimately took a bold swing, but there were a lot of obstacles. Um, ultimately, you know, so many people say to me what you said when you were doing the lead up with this, which was, how does this movie exist? How did, uh, how does, how is this a studio film? Um, and I always tell the story of, you know, I had lunch with a really great old school producer who produced in the 70s and 80s movies we love and a uh, famous old school producer. And he said to me, look, you've made this, this studio close to $2 billion in the last right. six, seven years with the Hangover movies and yeah. a couple others that we had done. And he goes, you've earned a lot of goodwill, but in this town, goodwill is perishable. You need to go out mm -hmm. and you need to use it. Mm -hmm. And that really is what I did with it, with Joker. We just used all the goodwill I had earned over all that time and money um, and put it all on the table. And um, it still was difficult, believe it or not, because the new regimes tend to not want to look back. They want to know what can you do for me now? And it was a risky idea on paper. Looking back on it, it seems like, well, what was the risk? But, you know, we were going into their crowned jewels their ip and taking something and really turning it on its head no the thing that <clears throat> the thing that the thing that turned around the warner brothers we'll call it the in the modern era in 89 was when they did the original uh, batman mm -hmm. movie yeah uh with michael keaton yep and they made a gazillion dollars yep. 
and in fact, when they when they became the distributor for Roger and Me, my first film, uh, they essentially were using Batman <laughs> right. money. Because sure. they were so flush with this cash, wow. I mean, that, and the same month they decided to to buy a Time uh, Time Life. And oh, they right, Time they bought Warner. Time Life before then. That's all Batman generated. Wow. So yes, Crown Jewels, yeah. Crown Jewel. Right. This is this gave them their that reestablished Warner Brothers. It's as, true as a go to place for the 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 mass audience uh, films. You're right. And so here you are sitting there with them. You're telling them that you're going to do a movie about a character who is a supervillain that they've long established. Number of people from Jack Nicholson on have played Joker, yeah. but I'm going to I'm going to humanize yeah, Joker. Right. I'm going to make him like a real person. Yeah. And there's going to be a sense of humanity to this. And when he starts out, he's not going to start out as a supervillain. Right. Like he's going to start out. Yeah. Basically a movie about a villain where the villain is the hero and you love him and root for him until you can't root for him any longer. Correct. That was sort of the elevator pitch. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And, but okay. So I, I, because I, so I knew those people at Warner's, I can understand in Warner's their, their ethos as a studio that they would eventually go for this. Right. But you got to tell me when they, they had to bring in the DC comics (laughs) people yeah that meeting yeah what was that like because how did you convince dc comics that you weren't going to, there was not this was not going to be an action film well the truth is and i haven't really said this but the real truth is when the regime changed with the with the with the two or three people that i was mentioning on the warner side the regime also changed on the dc side and they put a guy in charge of dc who's an amazing guy by the way but walter hamada who would had been running a small horror label at, at, at New Line. Um, so he didn't really have the muscle to stop it. And, and I'm not even saying he would have, but he didn't get it. And, and uh, I, because on paper, it reads, it's crazy. And um, it is, especially if you're writing DC comics. Yeah. And you just stepped into this new job and really that we just made Shazam and Wonder Woman. We're doing okay. Do we really want to mess with the formula? And so I really understood his point, but in some ways, I had enough weight behind me at that point to, to, to not overrule it because they could have easily said no, but we just kept our, our, our foot on the, on the gas and we really just kept, um, squeaky wheel gets the grease, as you say, and we just made a thing of it for a long time. And truth be told, the budget was so small and I say so small, um, in, in relation to other comic book films, not small. You know, we, we ultimately made the movie for $60 million, but at Warner Brothers or at DC, that's like an independent film to them. So we kept it so under the radar and so small that in, a, in, in some way it felt like not a can't lose, but like, okay, what could we really lose on this if it just is a disaster and if nobody wants to see it, if it's boring, if it's all this. Right. So they, they, they let us so go. So you, you, because you kept the budget low, mm-hmm. you didn't have them. Breathing uh, down our necks. Yeah. And we basically, it was something they ignored for a long time and let us go and, and do it. Um, like whose idea was it to have it premiere at the Venice Film Festival? Because again, this isn't where a mass audience uh, action comic book film premieres at one of the top three festivals in the world. There's yeah. Can, there's uh, Venice and there's Berlin. Yeah. And, and I would argue Venice has become really one of the premier ones of, 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 of launching a movie. Um, it's the oldest film festival. It's, yeah. it's, I, I don't know if you've been there. It's of the course. most beautiful no, I've thing. Had my films there, yeah. So we, that was Blair Rich who runs marketing there and me, because the one thing that, that the, 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 the that Warners was always concerned about was confusing the audience. And um, so they, they, you know, this audience knows what DC is. And all of a sudden we, they just made a movie a couple of years before Suicide Squad. There was a Joker character in that. How do you separate it? So one of those things was, was Blair Rich saying, we're going to, we're going to sell it differently. We're going to, we're going to take a different road with it. Mm-hmm. So if the movie's good enough, we're going to go to Venice Film Festival, which, which we, which we did and premiered there. Um, so that was all part of the, like, we got to tell people this is not the, what they're expecting mainly because we also didn't i thought at one point you know we're gonna have mass walkouts if you convince the quote-unquote fast and the furious crowd to show up to this movie because they're going to be bored by it so we wanted to educate the audience that this is not your typical superhero movie Mm -hmm. granted we educated them and they ended up liking it and not being bored by and love and and coming back but we weren't sure about that so we didn't want to trick anyone into you know word gets out so quick on movies no but the trailer was honest Uh, yes exactly and i think so let's say you're a big comics comic book person um 
I think you'd have to go check this out. Right. At least check it out. Right. Because these are characters I've lived with since I was 10 years old. Right. So, so, and the fact that not only uh, were you not pilloried by that group. I know. Which is right? the one we, that was the group we expected maybe to get no, pilloried. No, just from. the opposite happened. And, and I, and because I know some of these people, I'm not mentioning any names, <laughs> but um, they appreciated the fact that you took such a risky deep dive into the human being that is this character yeah that it made it it made it so much you know okay yes i didn't get my action scenes i didn't get the car chase the uh cameo from one of the transformers didn't show up in right the film. but it's it it is so um it's so moving. Now, here's my the problem I have had with my friends uh, on the left, uh, especially the, the more education they've had. <laughs> the, uh, they do not want to go see this film. This is back yeah. you know, a few months ago. Oh, no, no. I said, no, you've got to see this movie. Oh, no. Are you? I've heard it's he just goes around and no, no, stop. First of all, dump everything you've heard. All right. It's 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 like the, the world isn't flat. You know, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't. The, the the sun doesn't revolve around us, and Joker is not some crazy film to inspire people to be even crazier, more violent. In fact, um, the amount of so-called blood in the film is the least bloody R-rated film I've seen in a, in a long time, and um, and without again, uh, this is why I said the time giving it away. Um, the people who die, I have to tell you, to be honest, and I'm, I'm, I consider myself a nonviolent, very nonviolent right. person. Uh, the first three people that die, and by the way, when I say the first three, there's maybe a total of six in the whole movie. In right. the whole movie, right? That die. Uh, the first three, you're kind of quietly going, "Yes, oh, one of the three got away." Please, Joker, <laughs> go get him. <laughs> go get, him. <laughs> go get him, because, 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 and and we live now in a time where hopefully more and more people are sensitive um, and wanting to act on uh, stopping the abuse of women in all the forms that that takes mm -hmm. in their daily lives. And of course, this particular scene I'm referring to near the beginning, not at the beginning, but near the beginning uh, on the subway. Yeah, I think we were surprised by the reaction because one of the things that happened outside of, oh, it's going to cause mass hysteria, mass murders, all these horrible things that people were invoking was also, as you say, um, on the left side, where I didn't expect people saying it's just irresponsible yeah. depiction of violence. And Joaquin and I, literally, when we were making it, as crazy as this sounds, we thought we were making a responsible depiction of violence because we showed how ugly and horrific violence is. To me, irresponsible depiction of violence is when it's celebrated in a movie, when a character is running around with a gun, killing nameless people by the hundreds, you know, I, in, in the spirit of defending whatever, the country, the this, right. the that. We're out there and it's isn't it violent, suppose, isn't it ugly, isn't it supposed to be gruesome and disgusting? So to us, it felt... Oh, if we show the real world implications of violence, that's such a more responsible way of treating it. But yes, actually, it was surprising. And there's a long tradition of this attitude from the violence in, in the Greek plays to Shakespeare to all. There's always been violence right. in art, but uh, this was not a gratuitous violence yeah, in Joker. And in fact, what I finally I got so upset at listening to people saying they weren't going to go to it. I started insisting that they had to go see this film or I wasn't going to talk to them. Well, it's just because, hard when, when people have an opinion and then they hadn't seen it. So that's always right. a difficult thing to talk about. And that's what I meant about earlier about those think pieces. They were writing think pieces about it without having seen it. And, right. and like you can kill a movie after you've seen it, but you can't. How do you no, do I read that? some of those pieces and they they felt that they were doing something noble by they didn't see anything wrong with saying, I'm not going to see this, but I'm going to tell you yeah. what I think about it. Right. And it was it was um, there was even another layer that was more offensive, which was the people coming out saying, look, I this movie shouldn't exist because while I could handle it and while I why I understand oh, right. it. The masses won't understand it and won't be able to handle it. You know what I mean? Like the arrogance. Yes. And it just drives you crazy. Uh, but uh, what we realized, what you were saying about yeah. the comic book fans that we thought might be, we'd be pilloried, as you say, from from the, the, the that community, 
What what I think it what it what it I was did a, a talk a Q and A at the WGA about a week or two ago and, and and what you realize is they'd been eating processed food for so long and and like we keep giving them and and you know how Hollywood works Hollywood works the the audience dictates what gets made because if they show up to it they're just going to make more of it you yeah, know what I mean right so there's been this sort of we've been this direction where it's been just kind of processed food over and over the same thing and it's safe and we sort of gave them something different and because we were able to keep that budget down we were able to take that chance and you realize oh wait they want it so i said to the writers guild i was saying whether you like joker or not doesn't matter but you can use joker when you go and you pitch movies at the studios when you're when they tell you no it's too violent or no it's r-rated and it's gonna there's a ceiling or, or 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 it's weird like use joker point to joker and and let that be part of your arsenal to push different ideas through you know yes <clears throat> well this is this is what felt so good about the fact that i was seeing something that we no longer get to see films like the ones you mentioned taxi driver dog day afternoon network uh, network cuckoo's nest and if if this film does anything if it does trigger a studio into saying you know what you know the audience is actually a lot more you know intelligent than we give them credit for and they're willing to handle things and they don't just need to be fed the pre-processed uh, cotton candy, sugar foods that we, we've been giving them. They actually like, they like something that has substance. And that's what this film, I mean, it, it um, I just, I left, I wrote, I wrote this on my Facebook page. I said, um, if you, if you're thinking that you're being uh, irresponsible, if you go see this film, uh, the truth is, is you're being irresponsible if you don't go see the film, because we need to be talking about this film and what it's raising. And I don't mean just, I'm not talking just a political statement, but right from the beginning of the film, Joaquin Phoenix as Joker is he's, he's putting on his, um, his clown paint. Yeah. And what is he doing it for? He's got some shit job that probably pays him under the table. It doesn't, right. making minimum wage. Right. And he's out on some New Jersey. Well, like, Gotham street, but we showed yeah. it in Newark. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> But it's Gotham. It's Gotham. It's our version. Gotham's version. We call it Gotham Square. Our version of Times Square in Gotham. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So Gotham Square would be in Newark. Right. Um, but but and he's he's you know you've seen those guys on the roadside where they're flipping an arrow or a sign around to get right. you to come in to buy a used car or right. to, there's some deal at the Verizon store. Um, that's what he's doing. And the sign, um, it's the sign says, everything must go. Right then, that was my moment where I'm glad you recognized that. Well, I was like, "Wow, yes, oh my, where it, now? Everything must go. That's that's the theme we're starting with. That is literally the theme. now. I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> exactly. in the movie, which is the best movie. <laughs> and we're saying it about a lot of things. We're saying it also about your preconceived notions of good versus evil that must go. We're saying it about the the system. I mean, what the movie ultimately becomes about, we have to turn this around, you know, everything must go. Uh, yeah. Not to, and I, and, and I, his sanity, <laughs> quite frankly. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh, and not to make my second Greek, uh, uh, play reference, but essentially the chorus of the film where the chorus comes out at the beginning to sort of tell you, here's this, you know, this parable, the, this fable we're going to, uh, enact for you. Um, here is Joker spinning a sign around saying everything must go. And right then you're like, oh, yeah, that's actually right. And that's scary. <laughs> and and wait, I don't want everything to go. But wait a minute. Everything is going. Pick pick whatever subject you want. Right. Um, right. Everything that everything that we believed a president should be gone. Everything that we we were told that we had till 2040 to fix the climate change problem. Now we've just been told we have less than 12 years right. gone. Right. If that. Yes. If that, you know, and in fact, I have friends who think that it's it's too late. Yeah. I've spoken to people, too, as well. Yeah. They're like So so everything must go. Not only by the end of the film, are you feeling everything must go? 
everything may be gone. Everything went. Everything went. <laughs> and let's see what happens now. Yeah. And and it's so and and so here's this character that Joaquin is playing, um, Arthur Arthur Fleck. Arthur Fleck. And you know, he just wants a break. He yeah. just wants to he wa- he loves watching the comedians on TV. He wants a shot at it. Um, he was told his whole life that his purpose was to bring joy and laughter to the world. He yes. was told that by his mother. He yes. believes he has a purpose. He has this horrible affliction where he laughs, uh, you know, a sort of pseudo bulbar effect where he, where he where he just sometimes breaks out laughing in the middle of a situation, which is something he can't control. Um, and, and yeah, it disturbs people or people find it, <laughs> right. you know, boy, that's evil sounding, but it is a physical affliction. It's a real thing. Yeah. And, um, but then you also begin to see as his backstory unfolds that the mental illness that he's suffering, that is not his fault. Right. That is part of, of what happened to him as a child and then what happened to him later. And, and you see, he's struggling with it and you see this so-called supervillain has sought help through the social service system Mm -hmm. to, to, to get, to speak to a counselor, to try and and that's a hard thing. If you've known people who have certain mental illnesses, it's very hard to self-diagnose. And the the idea of them going on their own without yeah. intervention yeah. to get help. Yeah. And then uh, the mayor of Gotham uh, says, too many of these social services, we got right. to gotta save our money to give right. tax cuts to the rich. Yeah. And then boom. Uh, his counselor has to tell him, I'm sorry, you can't come here anymore because we don't have the money. They're shutting down the social services. They're shutting down the social services. And um, And then he loses his medication and he loses, yeah. And so they take away the pharmaceutical company, the whole whole thing. And, and, and I mean, the movie takes place in 1981, but we wrote it in 2016. The movie is a mirror to us. It was a mirror. When I say us, when Scott Silver and I sat down to write it, it was really about, Let's make something meaningful. Let's make something that addresses this loss of compassion that's going on in the world. You know, um, that we all know that that's been happening. It's not even just Donald Trump. It's been happening right. for years, but that's it's correct. certainly been exaggerated and amplified in the last few years. That's right. And um, this idea of the way we treat people that are different than us. And that's how it, that's sort of where the themes all started. It ultimately ended up becoming, as you said, about childhood trauma. It became about lack of love. You know, Arthur has no love in his life. Um, If somebody had just put their hand on his shoulder, if somebody just treated him a little bit differently, um, you know, it, 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 in the most reductive way, it's about the power of kindness. Mm. If you watch the film yes. and you walk out and you don't realize it's not about the power of kindness, then you're just missing what we're trying to do there um, and and how it could affect people. And I've had so many people write me emails, reach out to me at screenings and say, you know, I have a sister that suffers from schizophrenia and my whole life it's been a burden on me. Sure. And now I realize what it is for her and I'm yeah. going to call her tonight and treat her differently. And I'm going to, you know, like it, it's really had a profound effect on a, a lot of people that live with people that have mental illness and actually people with right. mental illness, you know. Um, there's somebody that came up to me at a, at a screening in, um, I think we were in, in Paris and said the thing that really resonated for them was when he said, when in his journal he writes, you know, the worst part about having a mental illness is people expect you to behave as if you don't. And that is so um, encapsulated for them, for that person, wow. what it feels like to have a mental illness. If you have a broken leg, people help you out of the taxi, people help you up the stairs, they carry your bag. If you have a mental illness, you're broken inside, nobody sees that. So people, just expect you to be, look at you. You look fine. Why are you so sad? You know, right. <laughs> they expect you to behave as if you right. don't have it. Right. You know, it's right. a very, it's a very um, powerful thing. So it's spoken to people. I mean, after all that stuff we were talking about, all the, all the, all the things that came out and all the, all the things that felt like there were obstacles, it was able to cut through all that noise and cut through the fog of just every movie has to kind of be, that comes out has to cut through the fog of podcasts and zillions of movies and TV shows and, and, you know, resonate. Some of them can't. No, I know. And are destroyed by it. Yeah. And I think the reason yours wasn't is I think I, and I, and I say this when I go to talk to filmmakers or people who are studying filmmaking or whatever, your most important job is to make a great film. Yeah. Cause if you make a great film, it will cut through and it will be a shield against anything coming at it. Because what they can't say is this film sucks. 
Well, they did that to Joker too. I mean, we did get a lot of that. People, you know? that yeah, film, just dismissing that, it. I mean, like critics were just saying. People who saw it. And, yeah, and and it was like a little bit discouraging where you just, you know, mm-hmm. but I think that's just By now, things. you should have not been, by at this point in your career. No, I, I don't we know, read them, don't but, read, you know, don't now everybody. Them, but you hear. Yeah, of course. And you've got Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, that's well, constantly, it's not even that. It's just like you get quote unquote friends that go, can you believe what this New York oh, Times guy said? <laughs> and you're like, I thought you're my friend. Why are you sending me this? Don't tell, I know. <laughs> right. It's insane. Yes. So, so in the film, as the film progresses, uh, the story progresses, um, the have nots in Gotham, um, decide to, uh, revolt. Um, I was at a Q and a, uh, with you, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, for Joker. And, um, someone in the audience asked you, um, that woman holding the sign resist <laughs> did that, was that just an accident? <laughs> And you said, no, there are no accidents when you make a movie. That's right. <laughs> Somebody just doesn't wander onto right. the set with a sign that says resist. Right. But, but basically the barbarians, as they are looked upon by their wealthy are at the gate yeah. and they are rising up and, um, and they think Joker is their leader. Um, he has no clue and doesn't want to really lead anything. Um, but they, He's but, become a, like a mistaken icon, a, yes. a, a, an accidental icon yes. for them. Yeah. Well, there's, the, of course, the great scene in the uh, Charlie Chaplin film where uh, he's uh, this lumber truck goes by and they've got a red flag hanging out the back so a car doesn't run into you. The flag drops and Charlie Chaplin goes, oh, he dropped the flag. I'm going to pick it up and run after them. And right around the corner comes this big demonstration. Right. And then you see Charlie he's Chaplin waving the, the red flag right. and the police think he's the leader of the, of the demonstration. But but it... But so there is this uprising yeah. in the film and um, and uh, uh, Bruce Wayne's father, who's running for Thomas Wayne, yeah. mayor, uh, Th- Thomas Wayne in a Trump like trench coat, which I'm sure, again, was just an accident. <laughs> and um, um, and who really, if there is a villain in this film, uh, it is what will later become bat this child is going to be batman yeah. later but his his father i suppose if he was if there was a villain if, i would if think the wanted, villain's probably the yeah. system right in, in yeah, the movie no, it's not so much true. him he might be the human embodiment of it to you to, right. to people but yeah but um, he shits all over joker yeah punches him uh right in the face yes uh <laughs> the the and but he doesn't deserve to die no but the uprising you know he gets he gets trapped in an alley yeah um so it it's very i think a lot of people feel and i think people watching this movie it it actually gets i think kind of quiet in the theater because you have this sense of yeah what is going to happen when people say i've i've taken enough and i don't want to take it anymore right when shit goes down when shit goes down and what and what we have seen in the last few years and what the 2016 election is, is that those people who are the, you know, the disaffected, at least the white people um, who are poor, um, were going to rise up and give us what we've got. Yep. Not because they were necessarily fans of Donald Trump. He no. just looked like- You get the president you deserve. Is yeah. what they basically said. Yeah. Yes. In our movie, you get the villain you deserve. We right. get the president you deserve, who's also a uh, an accidental icon in a way. For that, you know, he's become- um, you know, because it's very funny because a lot of people make that direct connection like you just did with Thomas Wayne, trench coat, Donald Trump. But I would argue there's a way to look at this movie and realize that Joker at the end of this movie is more playing that part, that he's standing on that car looking around at these thousands of people cheering him on and realizing, like, how did this happen? And sort of puts his arms out and goes, all right, let's do this, you right. know. Um, there's, it, 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 it's a funny movie because it really, de- it really depends on where your head's at. I've had, I've had people have both sort of reactions yeah, to it. Yeah. Really the lens at which you view it through is, and, and, and that's, what's been so polarizing about the movie and, and so divisive about the movie is it, it just has to do with the lens with which you view it through. So you bring up the scene at the end and he's on mm-hmm. top of the car and, and his hands are outstretched mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, in the form of, of, of the Jesus Christ sure. moment of yes, follow me. Um, so begs the question. I'm sure you've been asked this. Uh, you know, is the, does is that the? Is, are you telling us then that there's going to be a sequel? Uh, to <laughs> I this? wasn't really. I you know it, it. But of course, 
I'd be lying if I said a movie that cost $60 million and made a billion dollars, the studio doesn't come to you and goes, okay, how are we going to figure this out? You got to figure it out. You know, would you and Joaquin do it? And Joaquin and I have spoken about it. And I've said this before, it's not necessarily breaking news, but it would really be about figuring out if we could find uh, something that had real thematic resonance the way this did. Because I really, it, it'd be, I don't want to go make a movie now about the clown prince of crime. It's never been interesting to us. Right. Um, that wasn't why we got into this to start, right? right. We want, we, you're not on your way to making Death Wish six, right? Right. We, we wanted, we wanted to have some kind of thematic resonance if we did it. And if we could crack that and, and Scott Silver and I, who would do it together, if we could, if we could give it that, we, we might be interested in it. I have a, a filmmaker, a director friend of mine who, said to me, what are you doing here? I saw him at a thing. I go, what do you mean? He goes, why aren't you home writing the sequel? And I said, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to do it. It feels like, you know, really? You know, it's kind of beautiful that it exists on its own. And, and we kind of, we got through by the skin of our teeth kind of thing. And he goes, here's what you're not realizing. He goes, your movie is essentially a first act. He goes, the, the movie is such a slow burn. And it's great that it's a slow burn, but it's really that car that's your end of the first act. I want to see two acts of Joker now. Right. I want to see what the fuck happens. I thought that was an interesting way of looking at it. Yes. So I want to encourage you, don't, yeah. don't listen to the art snobs. Right. Uh, who are saying, oh, you're just doing this to make money now. No, no. Um, you've made this masterpiece. You've made a film that when they write about this era that we're in, this film will be referenced Thank in you. the way that films in the past right. were referenced about, about their eras. Um, this will happen with, with Joker and, um, but you're right that, it, that it really is a first act ending. And so now the burden on you and right. Scott and Joaquin is now we need to see your Godfather two, right? <laughs> Easier said than done. <laughs> right. Because sequels in and of themselves are not evil uh, things. Right. We can name the sequels that right. were arguably even better right. than the first one, uh, Godfather, Godfather two. two might be the one. <laughs> um, uh, for the for the wider audience listening to this, Star Trek Two, okay. Wrath of Wrath of Khan. I haven't seen it. Is uh, is <laughs> right because you don't watch comic <laughs> book type movies, but um, but no, but there are those few examples where um, and and yes, it's a, it'll be a challenge to you, but but we already know. First of all, you didn't need to do this. Mm -hmm. You, I read what you, the deal you did with Hangover. Right. You wanted to make that movie so bad and they didn't want to make it so bad. No. So you said, fuck it. I'll, I'll do it for practically for free. No, literally for free. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> literally for free. If it makes money, pay me then. Right. And of course it made a gazillion billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the three of them, I'm sure have made a billion or two. The three movies did. Yeah. Billion worldwide. six worldwide. Yeah. 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 The okay. Three, yeah. So, so. You don't have to disclose your financial situation here, but I would guess if you made that deal and your your pay was on the a percentage of the back end, you you made so much money that you didn't need to make Joker. Oh no no, I did not do Joker as a as a money grab. No, yeah, I mean we actually no, you were I having a cigarette. <laughs> On the sidewalk outside <laughs> Grauman's Chinese Theater right. in L.A., and an idea comes to you from looking at a fucking billboard. <laughs> right. You know that. What if? What if? And you put the twist on it right in your head. This is actually this is a commercial now for encouraging people to smoke. <laughs> but but seriously, by the time that Warner Brothers guy in the theater had come out, he had already spoken to the Warner Brothers <laughs> guy that you talked to on the phone. Right. And they were smart enough to say, "Wow, this is a." Really brilliant idea. Yeah, because just to go back to that really quick, it wasn't one idea. What I pitched them was we should start a label. We should start a label where we get great directors, other directors. Joker can be the first one, but let's do a label called DC Black where we make stripped down, no CGI, no spandex, wow. quote unquote comic book movies, but we do deep dive character studies. And I literally said, get so-and-so to do this character. I don't want to name them because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've never told these directors. Right. <laughs> and get so-and-so to do that character. And we started with Joker and we started an entire label. I go, why wouldn't you do, why are you, instead of trying to be Marvel, do something that Marvel can't do, which is like an R-rated strip down. That Disney can't make those movies. So instead of trying to emulate them, go over here. But by the way, you can still do your normal DC movies, have two bites of the apple. So to me, it was a very like, so that was the thing that they got excited about was this other whole label that ended up going away when the regime change happened and they started saying 
and I understand why they did it. Now we're going to complicate all these different worlds. Let's just, if we feel like doing a movie like this, we'll do it. It doesn't need its own label and blah, blah, blah. But that whole, when he came out of the theater and goes, wow, I want to talk to you, ride with me. It was about this idea of the label, not just this idea of one movie. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that was where it all came from. Yeah. That's, wow. That's even a more, a more amazing story. <laughs> it, I just want to ask you, because uh, we haven't talked about Joaquin and the incredible performance what did that take out of him? I can't, that, that it must have been so draining. It was, and yeah. so, you know, I mean. I don't think he goes halfway on any movie. I don't oh think my God. he goes, meaning I, it didn't matter no. that it was, that it was a bigger movie than he'd, right. he'd done recently. This guy just goes all in and gives it his all and, and, um, takes it very seriously. And we talked about it a ton before we started. And of course, while we were shooting. So it was, um, you know, it was, it was a lot, but, uh, he also has said since I've done a ton of press with him, press with him it, you know, it was, the, it was the greatest acting experience of his life. I really do think this character Joker is sort of magical in a way. I think it attracts people that are in, have a little bit of chaos in them. I think if you look at Jack Nicholson, you look at Heath Ledger, even Jared Leto, who did it, they all have a little chaos in them as actors, as people. Right. And Joaquin certainly fits in that right. too. And um, there was something about it that I think is really liberating for 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 Joaquin. And um, we just went for it. Wow. Well, but it was a, it was an ordeal to get him to do it. You know, I mean, he he, he to get a, Joaquin Phoenix. If you look at his last ten years of movies, this doing a comic book film, even though it's not really, but on paper, it's still called Joker. It still says DC on the screen. He, he was resistant for sure to that idea. Um, mm -hmm. And I spent three months up at his house saying, no, no, no. There, there's a quick story I said to him. Uh, I felt like I had him close. I'd been up there for three months talking about character, talking about tone, vibe, what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like. And he goes, uh, and we, he goes to me, I kind of expect him to just go, okay, I'm in, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I'm still just having trouble because it's still, maybe if it was called Arthur if we could just lose all the Joker shit and do that. And I'm, I'm thinking there's no way we're going to get this movie made if it's called, you know, like we have, this right. is half the reason we're getting this thing pushed through the system. And I said to him, he goes, I just don't know why, I don't know why I would do this. Um, and I said, you know, you're looking at the movie the wrong way. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, you got to think of it as the greatest heist movie ever made. And he goes, heist movie? There's barely any action in this film. Where's the heist? I go, no, no. I go, we're going to take $60 million from Warner Brothers and we're going to do whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> <laughs> I go, promise me, trust me, you got to do this. <laughs> right. And and if anybody from Warner's is listening to this right now. They know that story. <laughs> they know that, yeah, they, right. And because By the way, it wasn't like that. It's he a reverse to, heist now because they've made so much money. That's with right, it. right. Right. I mean, I read that it was the largest grossing R-rated film ever. Ever. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, Yeah. But yeah, the idea being like, don't worry, because I knew once we got the green light, once he was on board, they, just from my past making movies there, they're an amazing studio to make a film at for a director. People have this idea that, you know, studios are overbearing. And again, maybe because it's my 10th movie and I've made them a lot of money, but we were just, we were out there. The inmates were running the asylum on mm. this movie. It, it often felt like we're out here making a student film, you know? Yeah, well, it doesn't look like a student. No, film. but you know what I mean. I know, I know what you mean. That when you when you see Joker, it does look like the inmates have taken over. And if you're a filmmaker watching this, you're also thinking, "How the hell did this happen? Right? How did they get away with this?" Because um, everybody wants to play it safe. Everybody wants to keep their job. Uh, this doesn't look like a safe decision. This looks like a reckless decision. And some of our great art comes from this reckless abandon to the rules right and which you did here and um and i think that that on so many levels you can come into this movie if you just for the entertainment value it's there um if if it's if it's the time that we're living in and you are are you feel this if you just want to live in a world with more empathy the film is a cry for empathy mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would disagree with we could use a bit more of that yeah. right now. Yeah. But it's also a cry for resistance. And and the dregs, as they're referred to, shouldn't tolerate how they're being treated, shouldn't put up with this, shouldn't have their health care cut. Um and and you need to see the real life consequences of when you when you punk on the people who are on the lowest rungs of the ladder, 
don't just think they're going to hang on to the ladder and smile up at and you. And take it. And take I don't know it. if you've seen the impact that it's had globally, you know, at, at some of these um, uprisings in Chile and Beirut and um, uh, Hong Kong, where people are donning this sort of clown mask. Yes. And it's become I saw that in part Hong Kong. of it. Yeah. Yes. And Chile it was really big. And in Beirut, too. Um, and we just get it across the news where this symbol of um, dissatisfaction for whatever, there, there are different issues going on in these sure. countries. But it's become this thing of like what you just said, yeah, we're hanging on by this bottom rung and no, we're not just going to hang here. And it's been, you know. And if you think it's going to drive some of us crazy, you're right. <laughs> right. Because some of us have been driven crazy. Right. And, and you know, there will be blood. I hate you hate to say that or think that because you don't want that to happen. But if you're so stupid that you don't realize that you could only shit on people for so long to think that they're going to take it, they eventually will not take it. And, and yes, they may follow leaders <laughs> who are insane. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. But they can't all be crazy. But they can't all they, be crazy. Right. No, because they're not all crazy. Right. They're, they're responding to something. And that is the, that is the deep finger that this movie puts into the pulse of this country right now and the world. And, and that's why you've had a worldwide, I think, response to this. And the way that I saw that in Hong Kong where they're putting the Joker <laughs> makeup uh, paint on. on in the way that, that, that Occupy Wall Street, people were putting on the Guy Fox yes, masks exactly. from B for Vendetta. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's, and they want to scare those in charge. Right. They don't have the money or the weapons or the whatever right. to defeat the system. Right. But if they can at least scare it a little bit into, Hey, just give us a little more. Yeah. Just take your foot off our neck a little bit. That's all we really want. Yeah. We just want to live our lives. You know, it's, uh, I don't know. I was so uh, profoundly moved uh, after seeing this. I had to go for a long walk after watching uh, this film. And um, I mean, you've been doing it with your movies your whole life. You've been making movies that make a difference and that address something real. And there's something you realize, you know, after I've, you, you, I've had a lot of success in the business, but also a lot of opportunity. And sometimes you go, you know what? You get older and you realize you could affect change with something. You could, you could have an impact. Affect change is actually too big of a way of saying it. But, but why not use in this time that we're living in, in this 2016, when we're coming up with this idea, why not make something that means something? This is the tools we have, and I'm given these opportunities, and I think other filmmakers too. I mean, the best protest songs written in the 70s were at the time when we needed them, right? You can make protest movies. We have the power. We, I mean, the people making films, I'm talking yes. about like my director <clears throat> friends and the men and women that produce these movies. Like, why not do it? Like, that is part of the thing. So Joker was born out of that. You know, the, the reason we put Modern Times, the Charlie Chaplin movie, we reference Modern Times, we're telling you, this is now. Do you know what I mean? You know, everybody goes to me, the, the question I get on press junkets when they have four minutes is like, ah, so tell us, how do you go from making The Hangover to making The Joker? And I go, we made The Hangover as Obama was president. This is all a party. <laughs> now, like, we're in a, this is like DEFCON 5 here. Like, shit has to change. So we have these opportunities as artists, as filmmakers, as musicians, as writers and podcasters. It's our job in a way to kind of address these issues. So two points to this. Number one, you know that Hangover was not just another No, I'm, I comedy. know, but... but No, uh, but you did something in Hangover. Thank you. The reason why it it resonated so well is that, again, you the, the voice in your head as the viewer is saying, oh, he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> oh, that's not right. And then the fact that you would make Mike Tyson, who should have been given the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that that I, you single-handedly saved his his legacy. But but it's, I think, because you're a storyteller and a filmmaker, it, you can tell your story through Hangover. You can tell your story through Joker. But what you just said, your challenge to filmmakers is that you can make a difference or you can, I don't mean some phony noble, I'm up on my high horse, yeah. right? but you have the ability to leave a mark, to make a difference. And, and you, you were just saying this now in the, in the general you, the plural mm, yes, you, right. but I want to just say it back to you. Mm. 
as as and thank you for what you said about you know my films and all that but well you've been doing it for decades like you you managed to just say this is what i'm going to do with my career like you basically have only done that and and it's it's admirable to watch you're an amazing filmmaker we've spoken off camera about it you're a huge influence for me when i started in documentaries but you've just always known it you're just like hey i have this voice i've been given it i said to michael before we started how is this that you haven't had a podcast before you feel like the original podcaster even though you've never <laughs> done it you know it's like this is of course you're gonna do this i have had it but it's been in my head you're right for 20 years <laughs> it's just an ongoing daily podcast but yeah. no but i say this so you fellow documentary filmmaker <laughs> right. you who started out with documentary yeah that you need to make a difference again and again and again. I encourage you now that, you know, you are, you're already Todd Phillips. You already have an Oscar nomination for, we haven't mentioned this, for Borat <laughs> right. as, as one of the writers of, right. of Borat, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Talk about one of the great comedies of all time. But, but we, the, the audience, you need to after Joker, make whatever that next thing is, mm -hmm. whether it's the act two of Joker or or whatever it is, yeah. but you clearly have the ability as a filmmaker uh, to tell a story that can affect how people feel, how they see the world, what they may go and do about it in their own personal lives. That's, that's an enormous gift. It's not a sense of power. Mm -hmm. It's a gift. And so I uh, encourage you uh, to do that I'm, yeah. and i'm saying go back to documentary films no i I'm, understand stay where you're at yeah, stay yeah. in your lane yeah <laughs> but yeah. but weave yeah. weave in that lane yeah uh uh be reckless uh, give us more of this and whenever that voice is telling you usually if it's it's that outer voice not yeah. your own inner one that uh, don't do this oh, oh, oh ta, ta, please why why right. why come on why why are you doing this yeah. <laughs> anytime you hear that yeah you know you're on the right track right for sure and that's always sad. it's exciting uh to me i think and to other people who saw joker to think what else you will do in the next two years the next four years the next 10 years it's um um you know it's an honor to have you sitting here oh man to thank be you here so much on, for having me one of my first podcasts and uh uh, I wanted to do this with you so badly, and you just happened to be in in New York, uh, and uh, and you instantly said yes. And um, you don't know you're you're like a hero of mine. I mean, outside of the movies, the what you the way you speak truth to power, and 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 another thing I want to say really quickly is this movie Joker. You helped this movie invaluably, invaluably. You don't even realize because you wrote this great, beautiful essay. I'll say on Facebook at our lowest point, when it looked like this movie might not come out, when we were getting our warnings from the FBI and the army about credible threats when there were not credible threats. And you wrote this beautiful thing that got picked up everywhere and really helped um, eloquently uh, put reason on it. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, mm. just like, let's uh -huh. calm the fuck down and, and talk about what we're, what, we're, what we're talking about here. Um, well, thanks for saying that. And uh, I'll, if you're listening to this, I'll I'll post that um, on our website here for Rumble right. for the podcast, and uh, and you can read it. I felt I felt I had an obligation to do that. Oh, thank you. Because I was so afraid um, that the the film might get lost or buried or suffocate from the noise around it, and I wasn't going to let that happened i just became i know i didn't call up warner brothers i didn't call up you <laughs> right. I just, right you just did i it. was a self-appointed my friend he texted me he goes have you seen what michael moore wrote about joker and my of course my first reaction because i'm jewish and everything all i have are negative thoughts i go oh no what did he say? <laughs> i thought he was just sitting bad <laughs> oh no no i uh it's, it was beautiful it's um you know i don't like having discussions about oh this was the, the best film of the year, or you were the best actor, or you are the best, the best, the best, you know, all the, we, you and I both know that this is all a lot of uh, crazy making this award That's season right, and all yeah. that. But I, I have told everybody I, I could um, that they should see this film, um, that it had a huge impact on me. It made me thank you for what you said about what I do, but um, I'm a human being too. Uh, this isn't the easiest thing to do. And um, I, if this doesn't, I hope this doesn't sound too corny. I felt less alone wow, yeah. after I saw this film. Right. Um, obviously, in part because I saw it with an audience that was wondering, you know, how oh, how is it that we're still alive at the end of the movie? <laughs> we made it, you know. But no, because you, the filmmaker, 
um, who I had allegedly met only once before. <laughs> I have a photo. <laughs> There's a photograph <laughs> at Sundance. But, but I just felt I was less alone as a filmmaker um, because now um, – there's you. There's our our wonderful friend who made uh, Birdman. Yeah. Think of think of you know, know. Uh, or V for Vendetta or yeah. these other films of the last decade or so that. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more to come, please. and not as a reaction to Joker, but as a reaction to what's going on in the world. I mean, I do yes. think uh, the film directors I I talk to, we all know it's part of what we do is to sort of confront these things through our art. I think I'm always surprised how there are no, there, there, there seems to be a lack of it in music. When we were younger, that's what music was. Neil Young goes and writes Ohio. He goes off into the woods with his guitar and writes Ohio. These are protest songs. I'm always surprised in music. It does, it happens in hip hop <clears throat> to a degree, but it never feels like it takes hold the way it used to take hold. And maybe there's just too much. I don't know, but it does feel like it is a job of, of, artists in a way that it's something we should I think yes consider because throughout history it is it has been the artists who who do their best art during times like this mm -hmm. and it is often the artists that the authoritarians go after first because they know they have to silence that <laughs> right. that the voice of the artist because the people like the artists they but like you know the you know it's funny if you really think about it it can be done subtly if you think about what's happened in the in the mid 90s to the through the beginning of 2000s with the lgbtq community be, between ellen and shows like modern family and shows you know that we slowly shifted a, na a country's opinion of the gay and lesbian community through People like Ellen DeGeneres and television shows like Modern Family and um, the other one. There's been a million. But mm -hmm. we're and slowly everybody, you don't even realize it. And now it's embarrassing to think about, um, th you know, thinking of um, uh, somebody as, as different or let. Now it's just we, we've like everyone, even even the people we think couldn't handle it. They're fine with it now. We have we have a mayor Pete running for president, and it's actually like he's there and he's being discussed, and it's not it doesn't even come up all the time, you know. Right. So these things do shift; they take time. Things but if you think about it, the, I don't know how I don't know if it was a concerted effort on the LGBT community or or not, but it actually happened, and it happened through entertainment. Weirdly, a lot of it. Right, because entertainment, art, uh, writing. Uh, is these are some of the few fields where people um, who are gay and and or who are not in the majority of anything, whether it's uh, race, ethnicity, religion, whatever. Um, it's been a place. It's been a refuge, but a, and a welcoming place. Yes, to have your voice heard. It's true. And um, and so, like the comedians I mentioned at the beginning of this. Yeah. The Charlie Chaplin, Jewish, uh, Richard Par Pryor, black. Um, um, George Carlin, we talked about George Carlin. I don't know uh, Irish. His, oh, he was Irish. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no, I'm because I'm my family's all from Ireland. Got it. You and, know them all. No, we're and we're angry and we're dark. Yeah. And uh, uh, if we didn't have a sense of humor, we'd be drinking even more. Right, so right. I'm just saying. But uh, no, uh, Lenny Bruce, Jewish. I yeah. mean, you go. It's it's it is, and it needs to be. And more and more now, women. Our best comedians are are women, and yeah. they have been shut out for so long. Yeah. So this is all good. Change can happen, and it doesn't need to take a hundred years right. or a thousand years. We saw this as you just referenced. If you'd asked me at the beginning of the two thousands, you know, do you think like there'll ever be something called gay marriage, right. or we, we have a black president? Right. You'd say, "Are you kidding?" I mean, I'd like to believe we could, but that's never going to happen. But don't you think that? And then it, boom, right? But it happened slowly by people by, by making shows about like literally television shows and yes. movies where it's just like, oh, it's just his normal neighbor. Oh, he happens to have a husband. That's fine. And it's just like it just sort of somehow sneaks in and it becomes. A yes, thing. I believe that television, movies, art triggered it but um in the case especially with on the, on the issue with gay marriage i think so many people gay lesbian uh bisexual the whole genre here came out to their friends yes, their family right people at work and it's hard to hate right when you put a face that, on it like the that. the person that you're working next to and you love him so right, much right you're gonna suddenly hate him because right. he says he's gay right and and that took a lot of courage. A hundred percent. But don't you think those those 
shows sort of norm, oh. normalize it to a way where they could come out. Absolutely. Because there, suddenly yes. your coworkers are talking about that show and then you can finally go, you know what? I I'm, don't, I'm not taking anything yeah. away from that. No, I, because, and I don't mean to give it all the credit because it's still, it's still now 2019, I'm sure hard to come out in that way. But it's amazing the shift we've made when you think about 15 years of it and you go, oh, okay, it could happen. And my point isn't even about that anymore. It's about what's the next thing, right? you know, and you can go like, we can do it. And while, you know, we had, we didn't want to, uh, you know, I think Warner Brothers is not uh, interested in Joker as a healthcare as a healthcare <laughs> movie, but the but but the truth is is that when we do talk about universal healthcare, oftentimes or Obamacare, it does not include mental issues, right. um, and even in the countries that have universal, some of them will not cover mental uh, health, and that should be at the top of the yeah, list. I know. And we because need the to start, trickle down effect of that yes. is so massive, and yes. and and the costs that go with that when it's not addressed are so massive. Well, this has been an, an incredible discussion, uh, Todd. Uh, thank you uh, for being here on one of my uh, first uh, podcasts. And um, for people listening, if you haven't seen Joker, please go see it. I'm certain we'll be on uh, home video or streaming. Yeah, or, by the by the time this airs, I think it'll probably be on like the iTunes stuff. Whatever on that's. iTunes yeah. by sometime streaming. around the holidays. Yeah. Or yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, so so watch this film if you're the kind of person who's thinking, no, 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 no I can't watch this film. Yes, 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 yes. You you can, you must. Uh, I, I beg you to do that. Uh, uh, we'll all be better as a, as a result of you watching this film. And and I look forward to whatever you're going to do next. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was really an honor to sit here and talk to you. Thank Thanks, you, Todd Mike. Phillips. Thank all you very right. much.